request all of them to kindly stick to the time so that we can hand over the session to the next or may be the time that Kavya Chandran is the first speaker she is on stage said said talking on the role of end of session at the time permits Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Somushita and Dr. Kolvasha for this opportunity, Dr. Aditya for the kind introduction. So, I'd like to start off with my talk on anterior segment dosity, my third eye and corneal diagnosis. The outline of my presentation will be broadly uh, looking at the principles, the various devices, and the clinical applications. So, OCT was first developed by Moore et al. as a non-contact uh, method to provide higher resolution and cross-sectional imaging. It differs from B scan primarily in having a higher frequency, although it has less penetration, but in turn gives better resolution. The principle, as we all know, is based on Michelson's interferometry, where the light source is uh, received by the beam splitter and then is uh, reflected onto the reference mirror, which can be measured at variable depths to obtain the image of our choice. So OCD is primarily divided into time domain and spectral domain. The time domain OCD has a wider area of capture, whereas the spectral domain OCD has a higher speed and improved axial resolution. So this is a commonly used OptoView OCD, which is a spectral domain, and this is how it looks in terms of its uh, controls. You have the video screen over here, the chin rest for the patient, and the imaging aperture. So I'll go through some common clinical applications that we commonly use OCD for. The first and most important is uh, the ocular surface formus neoplasia and differentiation from other surface tumors. As you can see over here, the three primary uh, points that are to be noted in any OCT are the thickened hyperreflective hyper epithelium, the abrupt transition of the epithelium over the lesion from the adjacent corneal epithelium, and the tissue plane of separation from the underlying stroma. So contrast this with a patient or with this clinical image of a patient 85 year old male who is diagnosed as OSS and elsewhere. If you look at this OCD carefully, you will see that although there is uh, some elevation, but there is no hyperreflectivity, nor is there transition of the epithelium from the adjacent cornea. So this patient was ultimately a case of actinic keratosis. Other benign uh, lesions on the surface of the cornea are salesman nodular degeneration. You can see uh, these gelatinous lesions, and on OCD, they have a clear plane of demarcation from the underlying stroma, and they do very well post superficial keratectomy. Another important lesion is the Timon's granuloma. You can see here a clear cystic space with um, back shadowing, as can be seen in the space over here. An important tool is also in the management of corneal dystrophies, more specifically granular corneal dystrophy. Although it is primarily a clinical diagnosis, uh, it, the OCT helps in additionally ascertaining the depth of lesions, which further helps in surgical planning. As we know, PTK is useful only for lesions up to 100 microns, whereas for lesions which are deeper than that, you would either have to resort to a FALC or a DAC. Additionally, moving on to keratoconus, the OCT classification of keratoconus utilizes the thinning of the epithelial and stromal layers of the cornea, the hyperreflectivity of the Bowman's layer, and stromal thinning, which is divided into five stages. This study looked at the predictive factors for acute corneal high drops in keratoconus, and the three major uh, fact points that were uh, noted were the presence of hyperreflectivity at the Bowman's layer, a thickened overlying epithelium, and adjacent stromal thinning. So this is a patient who developed severe hydrops. You can see in the OCT over here how the cornea is extremely thin, nearly just 150 microns, and the resonance is not even visible here. So sequential follow-up of this patient who underwent uh, compression sutures, you can see that the stroma is quite compact over here, and this is the last follow-up after a period of nearly two months, where you can see a well uh, compact and scarred cornea. Moving on to uh, uh, important indication of scleritis. So although traditionally it was a clinical diagnosis, but the role of OCT can be useful in differentiating from episcleritis. So these are pictures of non-infectious and infectious scleritis. If you look at infectious scleritis over here, there is significant back shadowing due to the presence of a nodule. Whereas in non-infectious scleritis, you look at uh, significant engorgement of the vessels and thickening of the sclera, as well as inability to localize the posterior margin of the sclera. Congenital corneal opacity is OCT plays a vital role in the diagnosis and follow-up, especially in patients with Peters anomaly, to differentiate them with associated lenticular corneal iridoadhesions. 
If you look at this OCT here, you can make out that the iris is adhering to the posterior uh, surface of the cornea. And although a UVM would be necessary to look at lenticular adhesions, this is a useful screening tool to help in further management. This is also a patient of a check where you see diffuse uh, stromal thickening and uh, also hyperreflectivity in the posterior layers of the stroma. A small note about refractive surgery, there are multiple uses of anterior segment OCT uh, in post basic patients for the flap thickness, residual stromal bed uh, thickness and complications like interface fluid syndrome, intacts and also post PRK haze and post basic ectasia. So this is a patient who had undergone LASIK elsewhere about a month ago. If you look at the OCT carefully, you will see a small hyperreflective area just below the LASIK flap. This ended up being debris and no intervention was advised for her. Contrast this with this OCT of interface fluid syndrome where you can see a significant uh, hyperreflective space between the flap and the stromal bed. So this requires immediate intervention to uh, help in resolving the condition. This is a patient of epithelial inflows. You can clearly see these localized nests of epithelium that are present below the flap. And uh, this patient ultimately underwent uh, YAG to uh, disrupt the cell nests. This is the OCT of a patient who has undergone intacts. So in these conditions, the OCT helps in uh, making sure that they are in the correct depth in patients with uh, impending extrusion. And uh, they can be used to sequentially monitor follow-up. In patients with phatic IOLs, uh, it's very important because OCT helps in estimating the volt, either low or high volt, and also the orientation of the uh, uh, ICI. And uh, lastly, I'll just touch upon keratoplasty. Uh, in patients with uh, DALC, uh, to identify complications like double anterior chamber, preoperative evaluation in patients undergoing endothelial keratoplasty, and uh, patients post D6. So these are pictures of three different complications. If you look at the one on top, you'll see a significant detachment of the lenticule. The bottom uh, picture shows an inverse, inverse uh, D6 lenticule, and the right side picture shows significant interface haze. In patients post DMEC to assess the attachment of the ventricle and also presence of uh, detachment in the periphery. Uh, post cataract surgery, uh, decimal membrane detachment can be monitored. Although it is primarily clinical, but OCT helps in estimating the extent and the location of the decimal detachment. This is a patient with long standing uh, DMP who developed fixed uh, corneal folds. This in turn helps us to uh, understand the management of DMD with the help of the health algorithm. Uh, in a short period of time, I will skip this. And lastly, OCT angiography, although it is highly subjective in the follow-up of patients with uh, ocular burns, it, uh, in the initial stages and sequential stages, it can help in assessing follow-up. So uh, finally, I would like to end with the deco message that OCT is an essential tool in the argumentative both for diagnosis and sequential follow-up post intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kavya, for a very interesting talk. A lot of things which lie below the surface and ASOCT does help us to look beyond what we see on the slip line. With that, I'll invite Dr. Prabhakar Singh for this talk on newer diagnostics in microbial keratitis. Keratitis, but on the bugs. So, what we exactly do when we see a case of microbial keratitis, we examine them on slit lamp, we have clinical views, then we do fungus scraping, we subject it to microscopic examination, and we start the patient on treatment. And depending upon the final uh, culture sensitivity report, we modify it subsequently, and this is considered to be the gold standard. However, there are certain challenges that are associated with the conventional techniques. There can be overlapping clinical features at times, there can be polymicrobial infection. We know that there is a wrong diagnostic at the wrong time and there is no culture positivity rate. So, to overcome this clinical scenario, excuse me, advance me. So, to overcome all those challenges, we have more diagnostic modalities that, that are there now which I will be talking subsequently. So let's start with polymerase chain reaction. We all are aware of this technique called polymerase chain reaction. We amplify the DNA targeted DNA fragments. And we know that even a small amount of material is sufficient here because that will yield a positive result. And we have an advantage that we will be having a rapid turnaround time. The susceptibility can be determined very rapidly. And we, for uh, prokaryotic cells, we have 16S ribosomal DNA PCR for eukaryotic 
Sensei Academy by Fungal Bia Vetinus Ribosomal RNA or PCR and of course to identify higher species, to, to have a higher species level uh, resolution in fungi, we have the internal transcribed spacer areas or genes and this is why it is known as primary fungal barcode marker. Apart from that, we can identify a canthamoeba, we can differentiate between herpes simplex keratitis and herpes zoster keratitis. However, there are certain disadvantages associated with it. That one can, that the targeted organism, there is only a targeted organism that can be analyzed and it can even amplify the normal flora which is there and therefore we will have a, have a false positive report and the microbial DNA that is detected even after the successful treatment. So even if your, your patient is responding to your treatment, the results will show that still the, the organism is surviving and of course there is very high cost associated with it and there is a good accessibility to it. Coming to the next um, uh, I mean the uh, modality that is a mass spectroscopy. So basically I will call it as multi top only. That is matrix assisted laser resorption ionization with or without time of flight. So don't we do not worry with such a long name, just remember that this helps you resolve pathogens to species and subspecies level. So how do we do, uh, do uh, this thing? So we just have a culture, we just we just have a culture here and we just uh, subject it to centrifugation, serial centrifugation with different materials, and then finally we plate it over a surface, over a matrix that is made up of made up of four hydroxy cinnamic acid. Now this is exposed to UV radiations and this results in desorption, ionization, and subsequently, depending depending upon the mass to charge ratio, they will keep on moving towards the detector, and depending upon the mass to charge value along the x-axis and the intensity along the y-axis, you will have a spec spectra. Now you will compare the known spectra with the spectra that you have got and you will have the uh, organism in your hand. Apart from that, we have many other imaging modalities like uh, anterior segment OCT. Dr. Kavya has talked about it, but I will uh, talk a little about it in, in microbial keratitis. Though we will not get the organism per se directly, but yes, we will have the certain clues which can be given by the these modalities. So you, we can see that in early stages of organismal keratitis, we can see uh, Perineural filtrates here, you can see it can range in size in width um, from 20 to 200 microns in width and somewhere from subepithelial to the mid stroma level. Whereas, if it is a case of HSV keratitis, early stage of HSV keratitis, like a hepatic epithelial disease, depending upon the severity, this, the hyperreflectivity can start from the subepithelial level to mid stroma or at times can be from thickness also. As far as fungal keratitis is concerned, this has been said that you will be encountering. Um, cystic spaces in, in cases of fungal keratitis in ASOCT and this is how you make a, uh, there is a clue that okay this can be a fungal keratitis. Again, it's, it's not a pointing to the organism per se, but this is how, what has been described so far. We are very much well aware about the in vivo confocal microscopy which tells you uh, and directly goes into the substance of the cornea and tells or gives you or shows you the hyper-reflective, uh, high-contrast uh, uh, linear structures which are nothing but the fungi that is branching at almost 45 to 90 degrees. And you can also see the, the round hyper-reflective structures which, which are nothing but the uh, acanthamoeba cysts and trophozoids. Coming to the next modality, so so far we need, we required, except for the ASOCT, we required uh, even for the conventional method and the rest of the methods that I talked about, like PCR and Marditoff, we require a lab, microbiology lab. But can we uh, do without a microbiology lab? So this is something which will uh, tell you as to, we can actually manage even without having a good microbiology lab. So this has been described as there is a ligand. So what the, I mean, people have done, they have de developed a hydrogel and over which they have uh, attached highly polymerized uh, functional, sorry, functionalized um, polymers, and these polymers have certain areas which are which are uh, I mean responsive to various microorganisms, gram-positive organism, gram-negative organism, and fungi. So you can see here that the red one are the the polymerizing peptides, which will bind to only gram-negative organisms. That is the polymerizing peptide. The vancomycin. This one is the vancomycin uh, peptide, which will bind specifically to the gram-positive organism. So whenever this is exposed to those organisms, it binds to it. Subsequently, there is dissolution of those polymers and branch polymers. And finally, you can stain it with a fluorescent dye and see it under fluorescent microscope and you can have the organism. Quickly, I will tell you how we, we can translate it to our clinical practice. So this is the cornea which was infected. We placed these triple hydrogel onto the cornea for say 30 minutes and subsequently we 
took it out and we stained this hydrogen with various stains, various fluorescent stains, and we have the organism. So even if we do not have a microbiology in the center, in the peripheral center, even a non-experienced person can just do this and tell you the exact diagnosis. Next generation sequencing again is based on your uh, PCR. So I won't talk much about it, just a small thing that it is, it is of two types. One is PCR targeted amplicon, which is very quick, and the second is shotgun metagenomic loop sequence sequencing, which takes into account all RNA and DNA. So it takes a little longer than that. And of course, artificial intelligence, even in infectious keratitis, is not spared by this artificial intelligence. It is said that it can diagnose a corneal ulcer as a, with an accuracy up to 70%, uh, which was comparable to the ophthalmologists who were not a corneal specialist. So with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Yeah. for an interesting talk. These the most two common causes of increased morbidity are late referrals and late diagnosis. So I hope that we can bring this into our clinical practice so that we can save more eyes than we are currently. With that, I would like to invite Dr. Vini. While the transition is going on, if anybody has any question for the previous speaker or would like to elucidate certain point. I'm just going to continue on those two lines and uh, I think Kavya touched base on OCD very well and Prabhakar also touched base on AI and I'm going to kind of surface in between them and show what is going on in imaging side. Since we are into entry segments, lit lamp photography happens to be our gold standard, everyone knows that. And uh, so what I'm going to show you right now is how uh, these imaging modalities currently exist. One is on the platform of slit lamp. The other is somewhere in between where the smartphones have come into picture. And then can independent smartphones, can they replace our existing gold standard? And finally, I will touch base on the master of all everything which Prabhakar touched on. Uh, what can AI help in doing all of this? So some of these equipments I have, uh, and I have no financial interest but a lot of new slit lamp photographers uh, uh, currently now equip really advanced softwares. So now it is a world of not of hardware and we, we have very good optics even in the smallest of devices. It's a world of software where what kind of packages you get with the devices you know like this particular slit lamp with upper Swami gives you an ability to actually edit the images and also compare it with a similar diagnosis with different patients and it also gives you an access into an EMR. So uh, this is very important having a huge image data set but having no means to scan through it is of no use. So this is something where uh, these newer softwares and technologies come into picture. One of this company, Umbelsoft, is very famous in other medical imaging tools by general surgery and other systems. They have this Opto IT Pro for ophthalmological, surgical and video based uh, uh, editing software where you can plug it in uh, either at slit lamp or in the microscope and it gives you really amazing features where you can annotate each and every small point in it which you feel is relevant. You can mask out the areas which you don't want it to play while the video is playing. And this, this kind of uh, versatility is something that we need now in the digital world. Let's now start coming towards to the smartphones. This is one of the product from Remedio where they have actually replaced the optics of uh, the viewing optics of the uh, slit lamp with a smartphone and uh, uh, the quality is very well, very good in comparison with this. Now, why adding a smartphone is very important in this interface is because a smartphone itself is a very powerful tool. There are simpler ways to do this wherein uh, like how this adapter replaced the, both the optics. You can go with simpler ways like how LVP will give you this 3D printed customized uh, adapters focus for any of your smartphone models or for any slit lamps. You just give the two numbers. What is your slit lamp? Uh, what is your uh, operating microscope optical piece? And what is your smartphone? They will give you this 3D printed very easily. It's very simple and you can fix it, it on one of the optic and uh, you can go ahead with documentation. 
now slowly moving towards entirely for smartphone where how you can replicate a slit lamp on a smartphone by completely being portable is actually this is one of our product called Hawkeye where you can actually use smartphone with a portable light source which actually has a slit which rotates but very interestingly this is modular what do you mean by modular you can actually replace the front and place another imaging system like uh, chronometer and you can actually see IOP being measured through the optic of the smartphone camera which is very novel so like this you can do a very good home care evaluation now coming to anterior segment imaging completely based on smartphone little even more smaller so this is where a lot of devices have tried uh, up to like how we can get good quality images but because the flash and the uh, smartphone camera they are not linked in same in universally you know across the model so it's very difficult to make a universal device so we came across a simple product wherein we focused more on the software and made the hardware simple and universal which will actually fit any camera of any smartphone and the distance was calibrated according to the maximum of we compared most of the smartphones where uh, the distance was calibrated to the app and it gives very good photographs from the home so basically we wanted to put this into the hands of patients and not the doctors to keep it very simple the app is very very fluid and it just uh, gives you a key to the patient to just tap on the screen the photograph as you can see of very good quality gets uploaded uh, directly onto the cloud and the doctor can see it whenever uh, he wants it to so we corrected a lot of errors there like for example uh, magnification illumination out of focus same eye same patient and with the gravy app and with the gravy uh, uh, hardware gives you really amazing photo you can actually see the loose sutures in this one so some of these images captured using Gravi, uh, these are all my patients who, this was one of the patients who actually told that I'm having a white spot and I told him why don't you just use the app and just show me the photograph and I told him that it's infection, please rush, don't waste any time. So it's really handy tool. This is something that we want to give it to the residents and all the trainee doctors who are going multiple clinics in the private centers. You can keep it in your pocket. It has got a macro lens, it has got a white light, it has got a blue light and uh, as you can see here, that one is a slit lamp image and this one is captured using uh, Gravi Pro. Since the time is up, I'm just going to show you some features. The blue LED really is very good, helps you capture good epithelial defects and you can also do contact lens trials here. So uh, I just wanted to touch base on applications of AI. I'm going to take just 30 seconds here. Uh, so uh, these applications are already in place wherein you can actually detect presence of eye or absence of eye in an image or not. So what I'm saying here is now you don't need a technician at all. So a patient can directly capture image from whatever uh, source he has and it will actually see if the eye is present or not, if the image is clear or not and it will keep giving cues until you get a good quality image. So such apps are coming into picture, a lot of work done in Arvind as well as in some groups in China where they are trying to pick up these image identification and edge detection in various corneal diseases. Some of the work which we are doing in LVPN identifying corneal infections and also identifying corneal scars and differentiate them for triage purpose where you don't have to spend time, the algorithm will do it for yourself and refer the patient to your clinic or send it to a secondary center where uh, there is no emergency. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Hanit. Uh, I think what's the need of the hour is to have uh, something which is directly accessible and uh, very easy to deploy. So that's a very interesting information. Good luck. Dr. Kundu. Uh, Dr. Shumshila, it's, it's an honor. Lot of small words, seniors, yeah. uh, Dr. Hashim, Dr. Nidhi. Thank you, Dr. Aditya, Dr. Vasha. We need, of course, a lot of collaboration in that. Um, I'll be speaking on AI. Uh, AI, in terms of uh, the work I've been doing uh, at, at NN in uh, Cornea Refractive Surgery, I think my journey was uh, more accidental into AI. Uh, but now, somehow, uh, you know, due to my PhD, it's, it's, it's an aspect of work which I'm continuing. Uh, yeah, I think the work, wonderful work at LBP in terms of segmenting images. So, there are two aspects. One is you are putting images building a database and then utilizing the images to predict whether there's rejection, whether there's infection, whether there's scar. 
uh, many aspects of scans which we do in refractive surgery, there is raw data. So these are the two aspects of uh, you know data points which are generally put into an AI algorithm. Uh, and that is the concept of machine learning where we are actually putting in data, trying to teach the AI in terms of looking at whatever we need to look at. So if you're looking at keratoconus, whether it's detecting keratoconus correctly or not. So accuracy of data in terms of what you're actually putting into AI is very important. One aspect is of course, uh, quantitatively the number of patients, you know, normally the, uh, the understanding is uh, more the data sets or more the data points you put in, the more accurate the AI is. And what we need brought in very importantly is also the quality of data, right? So edge detection, you need to be giving the right data to the AI. That's also equally, in fact, even more important than just plain numbers. You know, I might have thousand scans, uh, put in thousand scans. And this is something we learned in retrospect when we started working on KC and Pentacam, where we found that there was something known as an edge detection issue. And, uh, you know, uh, AI area under curve was is sometimes very, very skewed in certain scenarios. And we had to go back to individual scans and try to, you know, correct the quality of scans. Okay, so that's something important in terms of uh, even in, in keratoplasties, even in data, when you're trying to look at, you know, scans, pentacan scans, anything. You know, if you're looking at ASOCT, it's important to look at quality of scans. So there are various classifiers for one of time. I'm going to skip to it. Uh, you know, you are putting in data. So how is AI trying to classify the data? So there are various classifiers, something known as random forest, something known as SVM, something known as neural networks. Uh, to simplify it, if you're looking at an RF classifier, it, it basically has multiple decision trees. And if you see these branching patterns, each one of those nodes are actually one of the values which an AI kind of assigns. So what AI does is it takes all the data, uh, you know, uses uh, multiple regressions or uses these multiple decision trees and tries to allot variables at various levels of the decision tree. So this is what a multiple decision tree classifies, what we know as an RF classifier. So an important aspect is training, but it's also testing and verifying it. You know, you need to know whether what the AI is learning is right and validation is an important step in AI, right? So uh, many of the algorithms or softwares we use has an inbuilt subset, you know, for example, if I put in 1000 patients, uh, it kind of takes out 200 of those patients and tests and validates. So it uses 800 for training, it uses 200 for testing. So that is an important aspect of, uh, you know, the models which we build, it's important that we even validate that. And that is something we've learned and we are validating the uh, studies we're doing. It. So I've uh, looked extensively on keratoconus and in refractive surgery, this is something we started three years back where we wanted to look at how AI can look at predicting keratoconus. Now, obviously the relevance, clinically people might ask, what is the clinical relevance in these kind of scenarios? And that is something which we are now applying to our clinics where you know we are using softwares and in due time, this is going to be integrated into existing imaging devices. And it could be an indicator to clinicians, you know, that these are the parameters which you have missed and these are the parameters which you need to be looking at when you're following up these patients. So what helps us looking at is looking at parameters or, uh, you know, uh, indices which we gently miss. And that's where AI comes into it, is where it's combining those indices or parameters which we miss. Because, you know, you might say, I'm looking at KMAX, why do I need your AI tool? Uh, and and, the, and the, on the corollary is the fact that we need to look at certain parameters which we might not look at. And AI is helping us in comparing and combining those. And that's what is important where we kind of accurately predicted progression and looked at these multiple parameters. And this is something we published. Um, what is also important, uh, Dr. Kaga spoke about epithelial mapping, is that any ASOCT, uh, well, epithelial mapping is an important tool in armamentarium as, as a cornea surgeon, as a refractive surgeon. In refractive surgery, the challenge is in the fact that epithelium is a masquerader and it actually hides many things which we miss. You know, you're looking at uh, keratoconus, you're looking at an early KC, it's actually a stromal change. And epithelium can be something sometimes confusing. And that's where an ideal imaging tool is trying to extract that. So we have a tool which is known as an MS39 where we used 2,000 of these patients and tried to validate that concept that it is actually at the moments or at the stromal level where the disease processes are. And many of these parameters which we found are not epithelial but more of moments and at stromal levels. So that is something which is important. And it was accurately predicting which of these patients would uh, are cases or are FF cases, uh, et cetera. So that, that this is a paper which we also looked at and published on looking at these 
uh, markers in, in the instrument which I spoke about, which is MS-39. An important aspect of any disease process is you need to remember it is not only imaging, it is also demographics and other risk factor stratification. Keratoconus is a clinical diagnosis, not a diagnosis by Pentacam. So what we found is that it's a challenge to integrate multiple modalities. So for example, looking at imaging and then you're putting in demographics. And that is something which we kind of struggle to look at and uh, just a couple of, just one more minute. Uh, so this model is where we kind of validated our first model and also integrated many risk factors like eye rubbing, IgE. And this is something we kind of successfully looked at, you know, one aspect of demographics, one aspect of imaging and integrated that. And this is something which is in translation where this is, uh, you know, this will come as an app where you need to put in these high-risk characteristics and it gives you a score or a risk stratification score. Um, a little bit of work we've done on uh, IVCMs, a wonderful talk by uh, speakers prior to this, where patients coming with eye pain, this is a, a continuation of the wonderful work done by Dr. Sharon on stratification of patients with Oculus of his pain. We kind of uh, you know, looked at systemic factors, non-statistic binocular vision anomalies, as well as confocal changes in patients presenting with eye pain. Not all eye pains are uh, dry eyes, you know, so it's important to look at these individual uh, patients. And, you know, it might be just one person of those patients who don't respond, but looking at imaging, confocal, systemic parameters, and an aspect of orthoptics is equally important. Um, we, the last work, and I think this is something which we recently published is, you know, before patients come in for any surgery, you know, there are so many determinants which can actually affect the way we do a surgery. You know, maybe the waiting time outside was too long and he got angry with you. Maybe, you know, the insurance was not right and this patient did not turn up for surgery. So these are models which we did in collaboration with Zeiss. This will come into EMRs where they will flag off certain red flags. I think we'll request you to yeah. summarize. Uh, yeah, so to summarize, um, AI is not the future, it is the present. Uh, there is a lot of work which is being done in terms of imaging, integrating imaging, and I think collaboration is the next big step where institutes can share databases and we can validate models. Thank you. Thank you. possible give the message in a more condensed way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. Slides please. Yes, we can hear me. Slides please. So I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible. So we're just going to have a very quick look at what specular and confocal microscopy can do. And uh, I do not own either of these machines, so I have absolutely no financial interest in them. So specular microscopy was devised by Morris in 1968. Basically, when light hits an object, it either gets transmitted, absorbed, or gets reflected. So there's about 10% of reflection that happens in the interface between the endothelium and the aqueous humor that allows us to capture an image of the endothelial cells. So there are various types out of which the non-contact is probably what we all use the most. So to understand the numbers, we need to look at the number of cells per square millimeter, the variations in size, and the amount of cells that actually have a six side or a hexagonal shape, and the function. And to understand these, are these phonomograms, CD or the cell density, the coefficient of variation, the 6A or the percentage of cells with six sides, and the function is determined by the central corneal thickness. So this is a normal patient where you expect to have an endothelial mosaic, small cells, uniform size, and approximately same size and shape, and at least around 60% of them having a six-sided Again, you expect attrition with age, so when a child is born, you have around 3,500 cells, but in an 80, 85 year old, you expect about 2,000 to 2,500 cells only. So what are the abnormal features that we see in specular? We can see both hyperreflective or dark areas or hyperreflective or bright areas. Uh, so let's start off with the most common or the gutta. 
the gutter and excretions in the decimals were made for, with, the, with the loss of endothelial cells there. See, commonly seen in fuse dystrophy. This is what we look for when we do a specular prior to cataract surgery. If you see them in the far periphery, they're called Hassel Henley's warts, which are seen in younger individuals. You can also see something like this, which are pseudo gutta are seen in contact lens users, especially ones who use high DK contact lenses and there's a low oxygen to the cornea. Or you see it in endotheliopathy following uveitis or glaucoma or any situation where there's an active anterior segment inflammation. The difference is that there is no change to the decimal membrane here and once you treat the offending cause, this will go away. Again, when you're measuring, you can choose to do a fixed frame or a picture here at the bottom which takes a square and measures the number of cells automatic, automatically with that square. But also if you can see the periphery here, it also measures cells that are not completely within the frame. So if you want a more accurate approach, you can go in for a variable frame where you actually manually outline the shape of the cells and count the number of cells. Analysis, usually most of us go in for automated analysis. But remember, automated analysis will only calculate small size of cells. So if you have any patient with an abnormal endothelium, you can make it semi-automated or allow it to capture cells with small direct cell. Manual is you're actually doing it yourself. So again, this picture A is a normal patient where you actually can capture what's happening. And picture B is you can barely see any cells. So in an automated uh, analysis, you basically have no values. So that is when you might have to go for a semi-automated or a manual approach. Again, quantitative analysis is CD, average cell size, which is normally between 150 to 350, and the variation of less than 0.3, with at least 100% to 60% of cells being hexagonal, with a normal central corneal thickness. Look for polymegatism and pleomorphism. Polymegatism is an increase in the size, which obviously leads to an alteration in the shape whenever cells try to cover for loss of cells. We use it prior to cataract surgery to diagnose fuse dystrophy in case of corneal edema and ethinitis. And uh, next, moving on to confocal microscopy. Here, it's basically a living microscopy of the cornea, allowing us to see every section parallel to the surface. You have a backscattered light that captures an image. The field is usually 400 to 400 microns. So starting off with the epithelium, these are the three layers, superficial, vein cells, and basal cells. The basal cells in the far right are the ones that are more active. They are mitotic and they uh, promote um, activity there. Superficial cells are the desquamating cells. You can see the bright cytoplasm. These cells are getting desquamated as we see them. Next comes the stroma. These bright spots that you're seeing here in the stroma, anterior, mid, and posterior stroma are that keratocytes. None of these are activated. I'll show you a picture of activated keratocyte soon. This line here is the corneal nerve. You see a few of them in the stroma. It's quite common. So if you have, uh, I'm not going into endothelium here. If you have keratitis, you expect to see a leukocyte infiltration of the epithelium like this. These bright reflective spots in the epithelial basal layer shows leukocyte infiltration. These are the subbasal nerve plexus in picture A. This is normally seen in the bowman's layer. If you have any subclinical inflammation or any inflammation going on in dry eye or contact lens users, what you see is an increase in the Langerhans cells forming dendritic cells. These are seen in inflammation and this is what you are trying to see. Again, these uh, stromal nuclei are all joined here in an apoptotic process. This stromal apoptosis happens en masse in any situation where there's an active inflammation when they all get activated. Uh, for example, when you do a collagen cross-linking or there's any stromal inflammation. Again, these uh, lines that you're seeing, these hyperreflective lines that you're seeing here, they are not nerves, they are fungal filaments, they are irregular, they, are, they don't have any specific branching patterns and they're numerous, which is not how nerves look like. And uh, you can see the pattern of the branching and the overlapping of the filaments here, this is not branching. Acanthamoeba keratitis can be diagnosed by the double wall cyst in the Bowman layer or in the anterior stroma. So again, you use it post-refractive surgery when you suspect some kind of inflammation in keratitis, dry eye, and pimple stem cell deficiency because it can also differentiate between the conjunctival epithelium and the corneal epithelium. And thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Ram. May I request Dr. Purvash?
can have some questions while there is a change of slides. afternoon to one and all and uh, this was this session uh, I, I would like to thank AIOC and Dr. Soma Shila Muti for this opportunity and uh, today I will be dealing with wet lab models for cornea surgery and ocular surface surgery. So to be an accomplished surgeon is the dream of every ophthalmologist and the sooner the better with least effort that is what we try and achieve. And in case uh, there are these hindrances in the journeys, they, can, they could be uh, tips and tricks to overcome them. And as we know, there's a generalized lack of human donor corneas in general. And following the pandemic again, there has been a scarcity of tissue. So uh, the back seat, uh, the corneal training in specialized surgical centers has taken a back seat. And just to promote surgical training again, there are tips and tricks in the form of tools like wet lab and dry lab models, simulations and the synthetic models which utilize either human discarded tissue or animal models or artificial intelligence and uh, virtual reality simulators which can be used and this training can again be brought to the forefront. So I shall be presenting some of these wet lab models that we have devised especially for complex surgeries like DMEC and in which we know that it is a very uh, a delicate surgery involving 10 to 20 microns of that membrane with the endothelial complex and the dealings with it are to be very delicate and they need to be for the success of the surgery uh, min with minimal endothelial cell count we need to be very adept with the skill set and the main three areas where we have to take care is preparation of the graft tissue injection into the anterior chamber as well as its dealings of unfolding and centration within the chamber itself. So based on these, uh, these uh, tools, we have also published certain models. And this is the humble onion that we have in our kitchens, which we have devised as a tool for practicing DMEC. As you can see, you can just take a peel and you can place it on the Teflon block and it Actually, you can practice partial thickness refination. It stains almost like the human tissue. It peels off just like that. And it can actually be a, a good simulator of the actual dealing and the uh, tactile reflexes that you have to develop. And this is the stamping going on. You can actually practice the various letters, P, F, S, L, whatever suits you. And then place back the cap and then divert the tissue. It even scrolls like the normal human corneal tissue. So all this can be done. You can even in inject it into the anterior chamber using the injector and then practice the various maneuvers within the practice eyes, artificial eyes. So another model that we developed for the dealings of the desmus membrane endothelial complex within the inserter to understand what will be the orientation is this uh, large beveled syringe or a glass syringe where we have uh, placed a plastic sheet with the endothelium printed on one side along with a P-marked stromal endothelial side. And if you inject it with a bevel down, the stromal uh, orientation is correct and the P-mark comes up and the endothelium is on the bottom side. Whereas if you inject it upside down, this is what happens. And then the endothelium is upside and this, as you can understand, this is good to demonstrate to your trainees. Next, we come to the dealings with the anterior chamber. Uh, the, the fluid waves and the uh, entire DM being inside the uh, chamber requires a different skill set of handling the uh, graft and this was published as the DMEC aquarium that we named it and this requires the filling up of a plastic balloon which is transparent and there is a plastic sheet marked P inside it which simulates the graft within the anterior chamber. So if you see in the human cornea all the manipulations which are needed can be practiced with this with this kind of a model where here we are practicing the unfolding by pinning on one side and then opening with taps gentle taps with the cannula on the other side 
Next would be uh, the uh, movement or the centration of the graft using the ripples, the tiny minuscule waves uh, produced with uh, gentle tapping with two cannulae. And here again in the aquarium model, the graft can be placed or centered from one side to the other using these ripples. Next we come to the waves or these are the uh, bigger uh, water fluid conventions which are creating the waves for central centration. Now, uh, another model after this that you can practice is the artificial anterior chamber with a piece of latex uh, glove which has been mounted on it and this can serve, uh, after placing the discarded corner tissue on it, this can serve as an artificial anterior chamber and you can practice all the maneuvers of those or the chapati, whatever rolls or the scrolls are formed, you can practice the unfolding as well as the uh, centration. These are the Lemec wet labs. Uh, coming over to the ocular surface surgeries, you can practice slit. And here we have mounted the goat side tissue on this uh, suction platform, which has been customized. If it's not available, you can even use the thermocol pad and uh, pin the tissue over it. And here we are practicing multi layered amniotic membrane grafting. This is the denims patch grafting. You can learn how to assemble the keratoprosthesis and then also practice how to. Uh, suture it into place in the both side model. This is the penetrating keratoplasty, the DSEC model, the DALK model, conjunctival graft, LASIK microkeratome. The corneal suturing can be practiced by trainees and fellows, corneal tattooing. All these can be managed and even the IBAN technicians can be trained for after the enucleation, then they can uh, create uh, CS or the corneal screen rims using this practice tool. And the uh, setups are very uh, simple to make and these are available everywhere. The very uh, specific one that I would like to talk about is the pig head model where we may have made uh, trainees practice uh, mucous membrane grafting where it simulates the late margin dissection as well as the oral mucous membrane grafting as well as the suturing of the graft onto the eye. That's our hero, the pig head and that's converted into a celebrity and can also be used for other extraocular surgeries. So, based on this armamentarium, I think the journey for surgical training can be eased out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Purvasa, for this very interesting, this period concept is quite new. So, it's good that we are making out new tools for the younger surgeons to pick up their surgical skills. Uh, Dr. Mamta is the next presenter. She will be the office the normal ocular surface does not get stained because of uh, presence of glycocalyx and uh, you know the cornea, the epithelium, they are very tightly adhered. It's automatically going. That's right. Uh, the superficial corneal epithelial layers they are tightly adhered and it does not allow to allow the dye to go inside. And as we go deeper into the corneal epithelium, the junction become more permeable uh, due to presence of aquaporins and gap gap junction, uh, which allow the fluid and the solute to pass from one cell junction one cell to another. And that is precisely the reason that, that once the superficial epithelium, that layer is breached, the dye, if at all it enters, it can diffuse to the surrounding cell. And that is why we get to see a picture which was quite well defined in the beginning that can give a fuzzy appearance uh, if we examine the same patient after 4-5 minutes. Commonly we use one of these, either fluorescent, lizamine green or rose bengal. If we talk about visibility on, of corneal pathology, then we need to have a dye which can be easily seen against the dark brown iris. So the obvious choice here is fluorescent, but uh, a fluorescent dye, especially if used in higher concentration, it tends to form an opaque tear film. So if we want to examine punctate staining, we need to wait uh, for a while and let the dye concentration go down. For conjunctival pathology against the white background of sclera, it's either rose bengal or lizamine green and they both stain dead and devitalized tissue or any part of the ocular surface not coated with the mucine. For rose bengal, better visibility, we need to use the green filter, but for lizamine green, it's the red filter. But as rose bengal causes stinging sensation and it is not very comfortable for the patient, so mainly we have shifted to lizamine green. But if we need to use one dye for both conjunctiva and con cornea and we are using fluorescent, then mainly we need to use yellow filter for uh, seeing the uh, conjunctival pathology. Like this was a case of conjunctival genosis bitter spot, quite easy visible with the yellow filter. 
there is something called odd quenching phenomenon of the fluorescent dye as the dye concentration keeps on uh, we keep on increasing the property of fluorescence also increases but only up to a certain extent beyond that the dye st starts appearing black so if we are using a very low concentration of fluorescence or if we are using a very high concentration probably we will not be able to see the proper staining pattern normally it is the excess of dye which is a problem with fluorescence and it is the lesser dye which is a problem with especially with rose bengal and for lizard in green also so what i do i prefer to use uh, this moxifloxacin eye drop because sterile saline it is a little uh, i mean not very practical for me so if i am putting it on the fluorescence i prefer to put the drop a little above this stained area so by the time it comes down the volume becomes a little lesser and then i gently shake it off and as i said it is a lesser dye which is a problem so in lizard in green and rose bengal particularly in rose bengal i prefer to use two strips together rub them wait for a while let it i mean uh, soak with the solution dilutic solution and then only use it on the patient we can use it either in the uh, on the upper bulbar conjunctiva or lower especially in dry eye patient we prefer to use it on the upper bulbar conjunctiva so if you are using a fluorescent dye always start with uh, the maximum available illumination because we are using a cobalt blue filter with higher illumination rb and lg are uh, like those spots are very i mean we do not get optimum visualization there so start with moderate and then go towards the higher one then assessment can be done immediately after using the dye or between 1 and 4 minute depending on the case also for example if you are trying to see cedars it's better to do immediate assessment then there are various applications we all know if we talk about dues to it talks about having more than 5 cordial stain and more than 9 conjunctiva stain for as one of the diagnostic step there are different reading patterns and this has been uh, i mean recommended by the asia society of dry eye and it talks about different pattern of tear uh, breakup which uh, i mean which talks about uh, uh, different uh, you know different type of dry eye marks line uh, in cases of mgd there is this anterior shifting of marks line we all know other applications cedars tests in graph in oss and we can use either rose bengal toledin blue and methylene blue out of these methylene blue has got higher sensitivity and specificity these are different stain and depending on the location of staining also we get an idea of what kind of pathology we are dealing with if it is superior corneal may probably there is this allergic or vernal inferior bulb we get to see preservative or medication induced toxicity then contact lens practice uh, these are all very common Uh, this is not exactly uh, corneal surface. This was actually one of the resident who by mistake injected the dye in the corneal stroma. This tribal blue, we can see the bluish hue here. Uh, this is ten day after the surgery. We can clearly see a uh, desmet tear here or lost desmet uh, portion here. But the dye disappeared. With, uh, very, I mean, without leaving any of effect of it. With this, I would like to conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. We come to the last talk of this session. Dr. Varsha Rati will be talking about the rural eye care model in the diagnosis of coronary disease. Okay. I hope you can hear me. We have heard about so many investigations uh, being done for coronary cases. Uh, I would just like to discuss about the rural centers where we have uh, some of the coronary diagnostic procedures. What we can do. We are located in 22 secondary centers, and I would be talking about what we are doing there. So this is a lady who had come to us while working in the field. She was plucking cotton, and she had red eye, and she came to us with the red eye. And when we put fluorescein, you can see the corneal abrasion, which was shown earlier. So a slit lamp is must along with yellow filters for everyone. And if there is any infectious keratitis, we do have another method of uh, having a 10% KOH amount of gram stain or pump blue stain, but not the KOH calcofloor white stain. This is. I would say must for everyone who is practicing cornea or who is doing cornea as a fixed facility at one place. So if you are having multiple centers, also you should have that at those places. What I am talking about is mobile diagnostic van, which you can have with various, uh, I would say, investigation facilities, so that you can manage patients locally or you can refer them to higher centers. Because information which is gathered here would lead to more tailored treatment for that particular patient. This is one year data of diagnostic van where we have done investigations in 8,700 patients, and as you can see, the corneal investigations were done only for 4% uh, of all the investigations which were done were for cornea. We compared to that, the retina were highest followed by glaucoma, and for cataract we have done certain other investigations. So these were the investigations which we had done from the van: anterior segment OCT, specular, and topography. 
And if you see the number of OCT is 50%, which includes both retina and cornea. So OCT can be there in the, uh, in the center or in the van. Topography, we have done only 1% from all the cases what we have done. So it is actually a pretty less number of uh, corneal topography. And specular microscopy was not utilized at all. So this is a data, uh, I would say data for one year, but then earlier also we had done only three. So we had removed this from our uh, van and we have put it in a tertiary center. So that, so that they can use that uh, specular microscopy machine. Uh, cost is dependent on provider because they would consider many things, who is doing, how many tests are to be done and all that, and how the sources, uh, resources would be utilized. For patient specific, uh, we have to see the context where it is being used. Uh, investigations perform, what are those? With referral, whether it's single or uh, multiple, and also the transport cost and wages for the patients which are there. And clinician cost can also be included in this. So if you see the medical equipment, it is close to uh, 97 lakhs and vehicle cost is around 13 lakhs. So total cost of the mobile van would be like 1.11. And uh, this is individual and giving you just not the companies, but the numbers. So that is how we have broken that. So for cornea, you can have OCT, corneal topography and pachymeter if required. You can do the thickness. And uh, specular microscopy as such is not required in rural centers, I would say, or for that matter, private practice. Expenditure for the van every month was around close to a lakh, so that we have to consider. If you remove the vision technician salary who was part of the van and also the administration, administrator uh, salary from this. For patient, we consider transport cost as 10, rupee, uh, uh, 10 rupees per kilometer uh, considering the bus uh, fare and the daily wages as 400 per day from uh, uh, Indian context. And single trip, then we can call them for annual visit. They don't have to go to the higher center. They can save the money on that. And even multiple trips, they may, they will, uh, I would say, save money on those. Based on the number of investigations, what we have performed, if there are lower investigations, we would reduce the, or remove the, uh, reduce the visits to those centers compared to the centers where we had higher visits. And we could manage almost close to 75% of patients locally, and only 20% patients were referred. So it is very easy for a person to do the test, uh, decide about what needs to be done for the patient. Because uh, if there is a keratoconus which is progressing, probably they may have to refer for contact lens trial or, uh, or collagen cross-linking, or they can do the trial uh, there itself as, uh, I would say, rural center or a private practitioner. Faster diagnosis is possible with this because it will reduce time for all and more efficient treatment can, keep, can be given for this. Uh, only cornea, if you think just of only cornea, it is very difficult to have cost recovery from the mobile van because uh, not many investigations were done for cornea and the manpower needed vehicle issues and breakdown of equipment also needs to be considered. All of us have seen these examples. This is uh, from the uh, diagnostic van and this is post of photograph I am showing. So if we have a right test and right time with right interpretation, probably we can help. Like this late, uh, young girl who had come to us with split reflex, we could see keratoconus. That time the center had just CCT was done and then later on the patient was referred to a higher center uh, after doing corneal topography and seeing the progression. So patient's visits can be avoided, money can be saved for both patients uh, uh, and for their same multiple visits. They can be managed locally and locations can be changed based on whether the number of investigations there are done or are more or less and investigations can be added. Uh, whatever investigations we have discussed today, probably I do not have all those in the system. We may not be having those. Can be done for tertiary centers, and referrals can be looked into and procedures on mobile vans uh, such as uh, probably collagen cross-linking or uh, with OCT, even retina injections can be done, and they can be thought of. This is a van interior because we have moved van from one place to other. These are the boxes, and these are the I would say uh, uh, the van which uh, we would be using. We use. And uh, this is how the van would go from one center to the other center. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Varsha, for presenting. We have some closing remarks of the session and any audience inputs before we uh, hand over to the next session. Uh, we are sorry for the delay of seven minutes. Uh, we got the all a little late. So thank you. Thanks to the panelists and the presenters for, for an excellent session. Thank you, everybody.